Welcome to the show, Kemirad. Hi, can I call you K? Yeah, K. It's it's so fun to have you, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a true honor. Thank you. So you've been called Oprah for millennials by CNN and the Wall Street Guru by Bloomberg. You're really humble, but tell us how you started and uh, how these monikers came to be. I can take no credit for those other than than showing up, but maybe I, I could just start by by saying that I've very much been the accidental entrepreneur. And the accidental, so many that those monikers are accidental monikers. Uh, what I'm doing today is accidental teaching. I became an accidental blogger. And so as we uh, go through this conversation, one thing that will become quite clear is that I've never really had a plan. If the plan has really revealed itself to me. But let's just step back. That's my kind of post treadmill life. Um, I was on the treadmill, the corporate treadmill that is also related to the hedonic treadmill where I was, I'm from New York city. I I went to Yale undergrad and got sucked into the world of wall street as a a bright eyed, bushy tailed 20, 21 year old. I worked on wall street for 14 years, believing that status Uh, prestige and income and power, I don't like to use that word, but I think your listeners will know what I mean by that, would be the panacea to a happy and calm life. And I was very fortunate to have a good amount of success on Wall Street, promotions and bought my first apartment in my, you know, late 20s and all that fun stuff. But there was always something missing, right? There was always the, okay, that's cool. What's next? That's cool. What's next? That's cool. What's next? And at some point, I realized that maybe that's actually not the playbook. And us left brain engineering mindsets, it's just like, there's a plan. Let's lay out the plan and let's execute on the plan. And once the plan is done, you've reached this bliss or abiding. My my spiritual teacher calls it abiding, enduring, abiding and enduring calm and happiness, Mm. right? That's something we all strive for, right? Enduring calm and happiness. Yet most of us have not found that, despite many of us being quite successful professionally. So that was my first career. I pulled the ripcord. I had put, I call it an angel investment in myself. I took two years of cash, put it in a separate bank account with my wife's permission and said, we're going to, we can make that money go to zero. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to figure out what I'd like to do next. Mm -hmm. And uh, like an angel investment, it probably had a 99% chance of uh, going to zero and a 1% chance of having spectacular returns. And thankfully, the, the way the cards fell were in that spectacular returns, not in a financial sense of the word, but spectacular returns in the sense of my, my, I'm much closer to enduring calm and happiness than I was when I was 35 on that hedonic treadmill. That's, that's great insight. And you're not that old, but you still took the chance to reinvent yourself. Now, what do you do with your time these days? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. I would, I would answer it by saying I spend a lot of time surfing. Uh, Part of that in, in traditional entrepreneur language, you could say that I, I traded that career for a lifestyle career or where I prioritize lifestyle, which sounds so bizarre, right? It's like, oh, I prioritized the things that made me happy. And that was healthy body through physical activity, healthy mind through a series of spiritual practices like meditation and journaling. And I have a seven-year-old and a a four-year-old and being a present father, involved father for them. So I inverted the script. So I'm going to start with those three things and then I'll build a career around that. And so a lot of my time is spent on those things. Uh, and then when we get into the more traditional sense of career or professional activity, I spend a lot of time writing. I love writing. I spend a lot of time talking to people uh, like this and so people yes. like-minded folks. And so my business so to speak, Rad Reads has evolved from a blog and a newsletter, right? If you want to put very, if you want to talk about products, it was a blog and a newsletter. 
most of people, most people who are familiar with the internet will know that a blog and a newsletter are not ways, they're not easy to monetize. They're you not. can't particularly get rich let alone, or even make a sustenance uh, income off of those things. And so from that, it's been six years since I stepped off the treadmill and I've really explored a lot of different things. Most the most of my income would probably come from executive and life coaching. I've dabbled with sponsorship, very difficult model. Didn't make much money doing that. I did a little bit of public speaking. I did some consulting. And about 18, 18 months ago, I experimented with online teaching, which is actually how you and I were initially connected. Yep. And it just, something about it made me come alive. And that's when I re realized, and I think now I really, that's the, the activity that I'm going to focus a lot of my efforts around and, and really have less of a portfolio of activities and more, I don't, I don't want to say I'm building a company because again, it comes with so much baggage and, and I don't want to, I don't want to fit in the corporate, in a known mold. I want the mold to fit me and the people I work with. So that's the, the most recent iteration is uh, around online teaching. Yeah, you mentioned that we met through through an online teaching mode, right? And and I'm really glad we met. In fact, the way I found you was through Ali Abdal's YouTube channel, where you had done an interview with him. And I'm one of those people that's into productivity. I have all the books. I've got Atomic Habits, James Clear. I've got all of David Allen's books. But your course really shone a light on what you mentioned earlier in our conversation, the why versus the how. Mm -hmm. And you talked about productivity, but it was so much more. Mm -hmm. Tell us why that topic was mm. important to you to teach. And you're mm. a great teacher. I'm sure it's in your DNA somewhere. You know, well, I, I thank you. I come from a, a lineage of teachers where mostly the women in my family on my mom's side, they're all teachers dating back multiple generations, uh, mostly in, Fran in France. But so much of, and this is why I, I often struggle with just kind of ex explaining what I do or why I do it, because so much of it actually comes through the lens of the first person, which is me. My writing is very first person driven. My courses, my anecdotes are very much through the lens of, of, of K. And what I found again, accidentally, or just by having so many of these conversations was that the things that I wore, the struggles that I had were actually quite common, right? And it could come from a, a first generation mindset of, everything must be hard, right? Or they can come from being a nerd or shy and feeling unloved or wanting a deeper sense of belonging, not being cool, right? I'm 42. When I was in high school, nerds were not cool. Nerds were nerds. Nerds didn't run the world. Football players ran the world. And so those struggles through my writing, I was really able to connect with a lot of people. And that's how they came into to my orbit. People like Ali Abdal, his amazing audience. By the way, so many people find me through Ali Abdal. So that is like the ultimate 10K work which we can talk about. <laughs> but then something else happened because I've always been obsessed with productivity. And I've been obsessed with productivity a, a little bit in the way that I was obsessed in my Wall Street career with status, power, and money. And so if you want those things, let's just say status, power, and money, if you can accelerate the rate at which you achieve them, in theory, you should be happier, right? Because you get the thing you want quicker. And so productivity in my 20s was very much in service of more, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And, and the more, I didn't know this at the time, mm -hmm. but I know this today, the more was because I felt like I wasn't enough, mm -hmm. All right, so it was an easy way to you know, self compensate for your own insecurities, your feelings of, of not being enough. So that was productivity in my 20s. Productivity in my 30s mm -hmm. was okay, I got a lot of it, it, it. Productivity actually just mirrors the career journey. I got a lot of these things, but 
I have not found enduring and abiding happiness. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something else at stake. Mm -hmm. I can't like be better at GTD. I'm already quite good at GTD. And so that really led me down. So I had mastered the how over mm -hmm. 15 years. Mm -hmm. How do you become text expander, superhuman? You name it, I can do it. Right. But it was emptiness. Same way of pursuing being a managing director on Wall Street. There was mm -hmm. an emptiness once you landed there. And I feel blessed that through some divine intervention, I'm not religious, but through some divine intervention, something in me flipped and was like, maybe this is not the path. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's actually different. Could you be open to that possibility? But a lot of people uh, in my audience, my listeners were, were not, they were just starting that journey. And so I, I had a little bit of a head start in that I had left. And I was, I had the space to ask these questions and I was getting good at teaching and communicating. And so what I, what I discovered in this process, and I'm still really discovering it is that we're all looking for that, you know, important, but not productivity is all about the important, but not urgent or the right. high leverage thing or the one thing, or, um, or in my language, 10 K work, right. The, what I realized that that actually has nothing to do with productivity. It it's actually has to do with self-knowledge, self-awareness, self-love. And that pre presented this really wonderful paradox, so to speak, which is sure, let's, let's teach you how to use the text expander. Let's teach <laughs> you how to do a weekly review, but what's it for? What hole in your soul is it trying to fill? What part of you is hurting? What part of you is untapped? And that by, by being able to talk to the left brain how, it's basically a trap. I trick you in the most loving way. Exactly. I trick you to say, hey, we could do all this stuff. You actually know it already. Let's get to the meat of the issue. Yeah. And that's where I've landed. It's taken me six years to land there. And I'm, I feel like it's funny, like, I feel like I'm actually, my entrepreneurial journey is beginning now, Yeah. right? Uh, which says a lot about entrepreneurship, right? It takes like six years to find <laughs> your starting point. <laughs> yeah. There's no shortcuts in entrepreneurship. I want to kind of hone in on uh, the, the one of the things you talk about in uh, Rad Reads as well as in your courses, which is 10K work, right? Mm -hmm. Can you expand on your framework for listeners that might be interested? Absolutely. So 10K work is, is a, a simple two by two matrix. On one axis, you have skill, low skill, high skill. And on one axis, you have leverage, low leverage, high leverage. And it makes, it bears, uh, it bears clarifying that by leverage, I don't mean financial leverage. I don't mean borrowing money to amplify your returns. I mean, just the leverage, the way I just, the way I describe leverage is the thing keeps happening while I'm surfing. So it could be a really good system and automation, or it could be a team of contractors, or it could be being a board member versus a CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Working on the business versus working in the business. And so across that dimension, we can go through it really quickly. So $10 is low skill, low leverage, right? Checking email. It's a very classic $10 work for like formatting Excel or PowerPoint lining. <laughs> uh, we all do it. Feels so good when you do it. Inbox zero, great example. $100 work is low. It's high leverage. So there's some scale in it, but you're not necessarily leveraging the right thing. And so in there, I put a lot of the productivity stuff. GTD is a, an example of a hundred dollar work where you could, it, it's definitely GTD was a strong competitive advantage for me because it allowed me to scale myself. But I always joke, do you think Jeff Bezos uses GTD, right? But it's, it's not worth it. You know, Jeff Bezos calls up to, you know, Janet Yellen and says, Hey, this antitrust <laughs> thing's not working out for you. It's not going to work for you. Right. And so at some point you can only automate yourself you still need the why, or you still need the North star. That's 10. A thousand is really where most people stop because a thousand is low leverage, high skill. So you can think of the 10 X engineer 
right? The guy or gal that can do code at a pace that's, you know, and they get paid a higher wage because of that. You can think of the partner at the law firm, the partner, the rainmaker at Goldman Sachs. You know, they have a unique skill that, that is usually from years and years of experience and being talented. And because of that, they get really high salaries, six, seven figure salaries. But there's one other, there's no leverage, right? When the bankruptcy lawyer takes a year off to go to Bali, the income stops because they are still trading time for money, either in a wage or through their business. Mm -hmm. So then you get to 10K, which mm -hmm. is high leverage, high skill. Mm -hmm. So how can, you, um, how can you leverage unique skills? And the most common example of true 10K work is hi like hiring, training, recruiting, retention, right? That is when you then transfer your knowledge to a team and you build scale. But there's a lot of, you know, the, the great thing about 10K work is a little bit like the four hour work week. You right. know, there's a different, everyone will have a different take on them, on it. One of my 10K work activities is my brand, right? Okay. And so, you know, my brand carries over through things like 10K work or through the rad mon moniker, Oprah for millennials, so on. So that's the matrix. And I would just add one point there is that that's not enough the, the, because the, what you need once you've kind of identified your work in those categories is really a portfolio of them, right? So if you're a first year college graduate, you can't be the Jeff Bezos, right? You can't just think about connecting with Janet Yellen. That's just not even in strategy, the realm of possibility. Strategy is not uh, the most important thing, yeah. Exactly. And so, but... Learning GTD at 21 is, it's still a hundred dollar work in that framework, but you're capped at a hundred dollar work. You can just start thinking about 10K work, right? You know, finding a great mentor is 10K work when you're 21 years old. So you build a portfolio of those. And then on the other extreme, when you're Jeff Bezos, like he probably is ruthlessly trying to do everything, nothing but 10K work. Yes. There's nothing more important to him than 10K work. And that's probably recruiting, figuring out who he's going to buy, antitrust, that kind of stuff. And so depending on where you are in your career, but also the why, what you want out of your career, mm -hmm. you will, and your risk tolerance, you build a portfolio of these activities that migrates with time, evolves with time. That's a great framework. And I think you've simplified it for people that might not be familiar with all these books that we talk about. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and if you can get a head start at 21, that's wonderful. Absolutely. I think that the, I love teaching the 10K because they get so, first of all, it's not about 10,000 making $10,000 <laughs> an hour, but it is, is there an activity that's a thousand times more impactful than checking my email? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a hard question just in and of itself. It we is. know the answer is yes. <laughs> we don't know what it is per se. So which kind of, I think we've asked this question before in, in your class, which is social media has a lot to do with this, right? I mean, we're stuck with $100 work or 1K work because we're constantly checking our Twitter feed or Insta or mm. the new thing like Clubhouse, right? Mm -hmm. I'm all, always in some room now. Yeah. And it kind of detracts. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an escapist route. Like, oh, I'll get to it later. Mm -hmm. How? What's your thought on as we kind of become digital natives and we're tethered to our devices? Yeah. How do we? How do we kind of um, draw a line in the sand and say, okay, or not in the sand, draw a line and say, this is where we stop? Yeah. Well, I, I would I would say that you use the word escapism, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that's the perfect perfect word. And so I would say, and again, this is where the why becomes so much more powerful than the how, right? The how being clubhouse, I'll use clubhouse yes. and the why being, what am I escape? What am I seeking to escape? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's just a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, but terrifying question that it's much easier to scroll Instagram and get that, you know, that high, right? It's, it's like a drug, right? You just get the very short burst of feeling good about yourself. You tap a few, you know, and, and we all know how they're architected. But what am I escaping from? That's, ooh. That's deep. That's yeah. deep, right? 
And, and so let's think about that question, right? Not, not the, how we might answer it, but the what am I escaping from? Where would you even start to? I hate to, my job could be to, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What am I? So, okay. So I hate my job. And what do I hate about my job? And then it could be some very obvious ones like my boss. You had a bad day that day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you could also invert it and say, what would my dream job look like? Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, Siobhan, I ask people, I don't coach anymore, but when I used to coach, I, I would ask people, imagine all of your expenses were covered for the next 20 years and you didn't need to build any wealth. I want you to give me a spreadsheet of how you would spend a week. And so let's see, we can do it really quickly where you sleep for eight hours, you exercise for one, you meditate for one, you spend three hours with family and you read for one. That, that's probably gets you at 15 or 16 hours. Okay, you got eight hours to allocate. By the way, in this hypothetical world, there's no such thing as a weekend. So I want you to tell me what would you, how would you spend 56 hours every week? Most people can't answer that question. Then they use the escapist route, mm -hmm. which is like, oh, I don't have time to think about that. Exactly, exactly. And, and so honing in on what am I running from? My coach is a great question. He's like, what is the pebble in your shoe? Mm. It's the thing that's, it's annoying. Mm -hmm. It's there, but it's not painful enough to stop, diagnose, take out, put back on. And if you use that analogy, knowledge workers, we're very much, we have lots of pebbles, right? And, I, and let's call a spade a spade. Most of those pebbles come from our childhood. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that everyone should go to therapy, although I think therapy is a wonderful route to start to engage with the pebble and start to engage, but look at where we landed. You were asking about Clubhouse and Instagram feeds. And, and so- TikTok, And TikTok and, and whatever, TikTok, right? Exactly. <laughs> but then the question is, what am I escaping from? Mm. Or, or you could even go more simple. What makes me happy? Like not short burst of happiness, like going on a roller coaster or going, you know, getting drunk with friends. What is that enduring sense of happiness and peace? When have I last felt that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would say that a few things. We're not taught. This is a, in the West. Yeah. We're not taught. Well, a, no one talks about this. B, when you do talk about it, you're kind of put in this corner like of like woo spiritual mm -hmm. hippie. Mm -hmm. And then C, um, yeah, there's no, yeah, we're alone in this. So we think it's there's we think it's bad, right? And so my vision, and, and again, what I've slowly started to discover very accidentally is that I can act as a bridge for that because people can relate to a lot of those desires that I had and still have many of. And I can show them, hopefully, I can guide them not to the answer because there actually is no answer. It's a lot like 10K work. Mm -hmm. But the process of answering it is a true gift. And that is where you will find enduring and abiding peace and happiness. And so that, that was a long way of demarcating the why, the how versus the why, and just showing that our life is littered with escapism mechanisms, alcohol, pornography, video games, social media, drugs, like weed, you name it, it's there. It, we have built a we have built an entire economy off of that escapism, right. capitalist system, an economic system. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully people who, you know, take my courses and again, not, not even take my courses, just listen to this conversation, just like, you know, what am I running from when I screw, when I'm just like run to, to clubhouse? The thing that boggles my mind about clubhouse is that most of these people have young kids, right? Like the average clubhouse age is probably you know, 30. 40, 30, yeah, late 30s. Mm -hmm. You're like in prime toddler land 
what are you doing listening to talks on AI when your kids are probably like begging you to play a puzzle with them? Yeah. yeah. What are you running from? I do have a question, which yeah. is, I know Jonah Berger and uh, Nireal and Cal Newport, they all talk about deep work and being indestructible and all that. But mm -hmm. there is this whole thing where I feel like if I'm not in cl on Clubhouse, if I'm not on Instagram, if I'm not on TikTok, I'm missing out and there's mm -hmm. the whole FOMO thing happening yeah. and I'm not relevant. Okay. That somebody gives me some meme or something and I don't get it. I don't fit in with, in a party mm -hmm. setting, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you, maybe that's something people don't address because yeah. if you're not a digital native, you're, you, you, you don't exist. And mm -hmm. I remember Kay, that when my daughter was um, in school, she wasn't on Facebook for the longest time, but then mm -hmm. everybody started communicating their homework and questions on Facebook. And mm -hmm. she literally got on Facebook for that. And, and yeah. I, I would argue that you would be a social outcast if you're not on some of these platforms. So oh, how, how do you address that? It's a wonderful question. So I think that I love you. I mean, look, my business is to some extent built off of the back of these, mm -hmm. these social networks, but it really does boil down to that. It's the, it's the razor's edge of what's enough, right? You could take some, forget, take the original social media, right? The news, mm -hmm. you could read the front page of the New York times, like pre-internet, you could read the front page of the New York times and the front page of the journal. True. You probably got the 80-20 that you needed to be a well-read citizen, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, you could, if you had to learn more time, you could read the op-eds or the second page or the business section, if that. But um, what happens though now is that we can't find that razor's edge because everything is in infinite scroll mode. Yep. There is no end. And so... It does require, but I still think it, it, it's that, that's that same question of self-awareness, right? You use the word relevant, mm -hmm. right? So, so we can unpack that, right? And in a meditation with yourself, like not a traditional meditation, you could, you could say, well, what is relevance, right? Is relevance being able to comment on the viral blog posts that everyone read, but you didn't like the Paul Graham essay that everyone, is that relevance Ch or, okay. It's not that is relevance being able to speak intelligently about things that you care about. Okay. Maybe. Um, and then you can keep going. It's like, who decides what relevance is right. And then, and then you can go a step further. Why does relevance matter? Does relevance make me feel safe? Does relevance make me feel loved? Like I belong? And then you can kind of answer the question from the reverse. You can ask the question from the reverse and why do I want to feel relevant? Right. And, and that's the beauty of this why is that it, it's not a prescription to get off social media. It's a prescription to know that um, nothing I can do on social media can make me feel relevant and, ex and understanding that. And that might change the way you engage with social media. And by the way, there's this extra concept, which is that it actually might make you better. The process there, think about Cal Newport. Yep. He's not on social media. <laughs> He's so, not, you know, amazing. <laughs> has that impacted his career as an author? Clearly not. He's actually better. He's got a column in the New Yorker. So you could use whatever. I, I, think, I think that this is another very long and deep conversation that we could have is that things don't have to be hard to be good, right? You don't have to suffer for things to be good. There can be an ease or an effortlessness in it. And I suspect Cal Newport Twitter just doesn't make him happy. I don't blame him. I could see why. Um, Twitter doesn't make most people happy. So you remove a struggle. Cal removes a struggle. I don't know him. I'm just speculating. You remove a struggle from your life. I don't like Twitter, but and we, and we then, talk, yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> yeah. And then you go and you do, you lean into something that you do like, he's a great long form writer. Mm -hmm. And so if he can find ways to distribute his long form writing, 
he has a better impact than writing 180 character tweets that are difficult to write that he doesn't enjoy. So you mentioned in your answer to me that, you know, you talked about whys and I, I, I kind of see a five whys framework mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that for our younger listeners. Yeah. And so it's really very <laughs> philosophical mm-hmm. where you, you, you're just not, uh, you're just not content mm-hmm. until you get to the root answer. Mm-hmm. And so the one for me, I might ask, well, why do I like why do I like being an online teacher, right? Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like, because I like connecting with people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why do I like connecting with people? Because when I connect people, I can make an impact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then you can keep going. Well, why is it important for you to make an impact? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now you start to get into some juicier questions. Remember, we, talk, we started with online teaching and now we got to impact, which I would imagine for your listeners and our peer group, wanting to make an impact is a very interesting question. All right. And so why do I want to make an impact? Because it makes me feel like my life is worthwhile. Right? Because if you don't make an impact, maybe your life is less worthwhile. But I'm starting to get into some hairy territory. Why do I want to feel like my life is worthwhile? Because I want to be loved. And so the question was, okay, why do you teach online courses? And the core desire, not the only desire, but strong desire is a desire to, to, to feel loved. Yes. And, and so right there, you can instantly go back to how can you heal that? How can you converse with that? Right. Because online teaching is just like a fifth derivative of that. Even if you were a great online teacher, you're still going to feel that desire to, to, to feel love and to feel safe. And so that's why what happens is people leave Wall Street and then they go become an entrepreneur, but they're like, it's not what my coach, my, my coach is, there's a Buddhist phrase that's neti neti, which is mm-hmm. not this, not that. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's there in uh, Sanskrit too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I thought that be, becoming a, a, an MD would be the thing that brings enduring peace and happiness. Mm-hmm. Nope. Wrong. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was solopreneurship, but I didn't figure out how to make money. Nope wrong. I figured out how to make money. Not this, not this, Mm -hmm. not this, not this. And then you, 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 and this is the thing that I discovered when I left wall street accidentally. I'm like, okay, I've seen this play out a few times. It's not working. It must be something else. I thought it was entrepreneurship actually though. And I keep going. I had my most successful course launch, six figure course launch. Yep. Feeling still there. It's less, but it's still there. Yeah. yeah. And that's when, as a seeker, it almost, you can see, like I'm smiling. It actually, at first, it's scary and it's frustrating because mm-hmm. you, you put all your hopes on that. Yeah. I'm convinced now for my own life that there is nothing external that can make me feel calm and at peace. It's all in my head. So, entrepreneurship followers, revenue, it doesn't matter. So you can, it, you can map your life to numbers like, okay, 20 million and hundred thousand followers, whatever. Yeah. You, yeah. No, not even numbers. It, it cannot be external. Okay. It's all in your head. And so that could sound daunting to some of your listeners. That could sound scary. Um, but I think it's beautiful because the, the inverse of it is you actually have everything you need already. Find that already. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. And it's in you. And the beauty of life, of inquiry, of philosophy is to go on that journey, right? So we always thought that the hero's journey was to like, you know, get the company from seed to IPO. Right. The hero's journey is actually internal. And look, those external things will shape it but they're not it. And that is tremendously liberating. It is liberating. And and when you talk, I'm reminded of Morpheus and Neo in uh, the matrix, Mm -hmm. you know, the red pill, blue pill moment. And maybe the the question for you, what if you'd taken the blue pill instead? I'm assuming there wasn't a Morpheus, it was you, but what if you'd taken the blue pill instead and stayed on wall street? How do you think your life would be different? (sighs) 
I'd have much better health insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's hard to speculate, but I would, I wouldn't, there was a lot, my, one of my teachers calls it dis-ease, right? Not disease, but dis-ease. Mm -hmm. There was just a lot of strife, mm -hmm. internal agitation. I, I would remember that I'd be, yeah, like, I don't like my job. This boss is this, I got this paycheck, but I'm not happy. And, and then my, my daughter would just come in that moment and ask for a hug and be like, get away from me. She did nothing, the thing that I purport to love most, the relationship that is sacred, but because of some internal angst, it hardened my heart in that so moment. There was a dissonance, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that I would, I suspect that I would just have lived with a hardened heart. I, I'd smile less, the energy that I would put around. And I think that that would actually probably translate into my health. And I, I can give you a, a very quick anecdote is for someone who fe doesn't feel quite not, stressful, like I don't have a boss, I'm financially mm -hmm. fine. I have a business that works. I exercise multiple hours. I spend between my mental and spiritual physical health mental, spiritual, and physical health, I spend three to four hours on that every day Great. between exercise, fitness, meditation, and I have high blood pressure, 41 years old, I weigh 150 pounds. Um, and I went the holistic route and the Western route. And the holistic route was, have you ever thought about the expectations that you put on yourself? You're not stressed in the traditional sense of the word, like your boss can't call you at midnight and tell you to do something and ruin your weekend. <laughs> but your stress is different. Mm -hmm. Your stress is the expectations that you put on yourself. I'm going to be the best surfer. I'm going to mm -hmm. um, grow the revenue, right? Like this, even though you're I don't- a, You're a solopreneur now, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that, that, that expectation, it's in, it's in your head. And so the point that I'm making with this is that these things, that we could say are just all in our head, they actually manifest in the mm. body. Mm. So I've been actually working through with a holistic healer to lower the expectations I have for myself. Mm -hmm. And it's actually had an impact on my blood pressure. Mm. Wow, wow. So the mind-body connection is real. It's, <laughs> I was, you know, it's one of those things where you always believe that it's true. Yep. You're like, intellectually, you believe that it's true. Emotionally, you won't mm. accept it. Because there's too many variables. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to remark on was is rad reads, right? Kay, could you tell us a little bit about rad reads and how you curate your articles? Because they're fantastic. Uh, everyone, including Adam Grant, has raved about it. Oh, thank you. It's fun when your things can be easy when your labor of love. Uh, can actually add value to to others. And I would say I, I, I'm just a voracious internet reader. And so I probably, I'm quite active on Twitter, at least consumer, but I probably subscribe to 70 or so email newsletters. Uh, as a writer, it just helps me get a pulse of like what people care about. And so, you know, I, I, I try to, so I get exposed to a lot of ideas through newsletters and, you know, like anything, um, it, it's uh, kind of subject to a power law where you know, the five newsletters that I read have, you know, 10 of them, 80% of the most interesting links. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time on newsletters. I do try a few tactics where I try to stay away from the more mainstream, you know, like pocket recommends. And I have folks that are quite good at socio you know, socioeconomic and policy. And I have right, folks right. that are really quirky productivity, not your medium.com story. So I look for diverse sources and I try to uh, include, I'm not great at it, but I try to have inclusive voices as well as the writers that I'm featuring. A lot of clipping, organized, organized in Notion, compiled by my virtual assistant. So it's actually that entire newsletter outside of the reading and the essay takes me like under an hour to put together. Great. Where can people find you? 
The thank you for for offering. Uh, it's uh, radreads.co, um, R A D R E A D S, and the rad is is my homage to surf and skate culture and the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles where uh, to be rad is to be effortlessly cool. And I believe that all of my readers uh, are effortlessly cool, yourself included. Thank you. Um, and then my Twitter is my, my first name, which is K-H-E-M-A-R-I-D-H. But I'm sure you'll drop that into the show notes. I will absolutely drop that into the show notes. Quick uh, lightning round. Yes. What's your superpower? Mm. I'd say consistency. I, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the most creative. Definitely don't read the hardest things, but things that sh I'm very good at putting one foot in front of the other and doing it for many, for decades. Word of the year for 2021. Oh, breathe, breathe. I think that the health, some of the health things I was telling you about, uh, I just need to re remind myself, like we all do with is that you don't need to do everything, right? You don't need to have the biggest company. You don't need to make the most money. You don't have to have even the best course, right? Like just breathe. That's the word. Favorite book? Oof. Any book? Yeah. A favorite book would be, it's, uh, it's called A Little Life. Uh, it's a fiction book. It's, it's just beautifully written. It's harrowing and dark. It's one of those books that stays with you for your entire life. Highly, highly recommended. Tanya Na Naga Nagayar, I believe. Okay, thank you. I'll put that in the show notes. Favorite, favorite song? Arcade Fire Funerals. <laughs> I remember that from the class. <laughs> <laughs> and any takeaways for the listeners? Give us three. Uh, takeaways for the listeners. The first one would be whenever you run into that, whenever you encounter that pebble, pause. Don't brush it aside. That pebble is not a hindrance. It's a source of gold and truth. The first one. The second one is um, ask yourself, what if it were easy, right? You, you just asked me about the newsletter. It's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy and it's good. Things can be easy and they can be beautiful. They can be good. They can serve others. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third is, um, is you're enough. Mm -hmm. and you are enough. There's nothing more that you, the listener, can do to feel, to receive more love. You are enough. There's so, so there's nothing you can do to make yourself more. I love that. This is a future of work uh, podcast case. So any words of wisdom on how the future of work evolves, given that you are the Oprah for millennials, <laughs> um, maybe a word of wisdom here would be great. There's a Carl Jung quote that says that until we make the unspoken spoken, it will dictate our lives and we will call it truth, call it faith. And so as the world becomes more digital and decentralized, um, things that were quite natural, like social, um, I call implicit norms, right, were much easier to communicate in person, right? You, you, you would see, you know, the order at which people would respond in a meeting, or you would see uh, how feedback was given because you could read body language, things like that. The implicit norms, these quiet norms are, are much difficult, much harder in a non-physical world. And so they're just as important. And so I would recommend, and I would hope, because when, once you rip out these norms, everyone's unsure, everyone's walking on eggshells. And so uh, if you could restate, you know, define these norms and talk about them so that you don't have to walk on eggshells and, and we can, you can all be, you can all embrace them and define them collectively, uh, then you would remove so much unnecessary suffering in the workplace. That's, that's really profound. And um, it's been so much fun chatting with you. And I look forward to staying in touch. Um, thank you, Kay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Shirvana. Thank you to all of your listeners uh, for, uh, for, for listening to me and for, for hosting me. I can't wait to listen. Have a great weekend. Bye. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.